All right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. This is a collaborative event uh, between the STOA and John Robb's Gorilla, uh, Global Gorilla Report. Um, so there's going to be a mix here of both of our communities. And depending on how this goes, this might be a monthly thing. Uh, every time John releases uh, one of his reports, uh, we can have a session here at the, at the STOA and, and jam and uh, uh, talk about it. Uh, so for the people who are coming from the STOA side, uh, who are being introduced uh, to John for the first time, a brief introduction on John. Uh, John used to work in counterterrorism for the United States Special Operations Command, and uh, he's a total renaissance man, uh, been engaged in the internet analysis, entrepreneur, work in resilience communities, uh, and doing military now, uh, theorist uh, um, with something called the Global Guerrillas Report, uh, I think started in 2004. Um, and uh, John has been... Uh, one thing that's really great about John, he's been talking about uh, open source warfare, but he has um, it's like an artistry with with terms and concepts, system punk, crowd slaves, long night, and it really helps kind of like harmonize my mind of what's happening. And uh, as, 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 as most of us here know, war is happening. And if you've been on the internet, especially Twitter, it's become a disappointing shit show. Um, but John is one of the uh, men I go to to make sense of what is happening. And um, Today is going to be a discussion on a report, the February report on, um, I'm going to share my screen on John's uh, uh, Global Gorilla, and it's called Swarms versus Nukes. Uh, and I'll read the, this portion. The global open source movement composed of nations, corporations, and individuals has assembled in just a few days to oppose Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It is now conducting swarming attacks on the country with the most nuclear weapons in the world. The worlds of nuclear peace have been kept safe for 80 years, are now in tatters. All right, so it's a heavy uh, topic um, today. And how's it going to work? I'm going to take in John in a moment, and he's uh, going to talk about the report, share his thoughts, and we're going to have a conversation, uh, Q&A. So uh, put your questions in the, in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, if you don't want to be on YouTube, I can read your question on your behalf, or I can edit out. Um, your share if you don't want to be on YouTube, or you can just ask me to pause the recording. If, when you ask your question, I can pause it, then you ask your question, then I can return the recording back on in case you don't want to be uh, on, on YouTube. Um, so I think that's everything. Uh, John, uh, let me just give a, a access to everyone to unmute themselves. So John, welcome back to the STOA. And uh, is there anything that you think would be good to add uh, in what I said? Yeah, um, thanks for doing this. This is fun to have a you know, big group. Um, all deep thinkers. I've been on the STOA quite a few times in the past. It's worked out great. Um, great conversations, uh, great opportunity to kind of think through uh, issues. Um, most of this, I, I think I'll just go over the highlights of the report. Uh, there's so much information and so many different ways of looking at this and approaching this problem. Um, it's probably best to come out in conversation or, you know, Q&A. Uh, otherwise, it's like, <laughs> you know, cutting all the way through the onion and it's like a mess, right? So um, let's peel it off at a layer at a time. So um, the basics and, you know, what this report focused on is that, you know, we had an incident in Ukraine, obviously, and, and um, you know, regional war. Uh, one of the big drivers of the war was uh, NATO membership, EU membership for the Ukraine or for, for Ukraine. I keep on slipping between those two. Um, and um, that had always been kind of a no-no. You know, it's like Clinton came up with the NATO expansion policy, in a, I guess, according to uh, historians in a hallway conversation with people who were working on genocide issues. Mm -hmm. um, they asked him what, how he would stop genocide. And he said, well, you tell me. And they said, well, expand NATO. And he goes, oh, that's a great idea. And it just kind of happened. And there wasn't really any cost-benefit analysis, how, uh, in particular, they didn't really focus on the big issues in the post-Cold War era, which was, you know, how do you onboard Russia and China successfully into the global system? So you don't go from, at the end of the Cold War, zero global competitors to two authoritarian competitors that are going to wreck the system, that are both connected to it and hostile to it. Um, instead, we spent two decades in the Middle East at least in foreign policy sense in the US, focused on chasing after Middle East oil under the assumption that 
given that the U.S. was uh, producing less and less oil every year, that uh, that oil would be important. And now the U.S. is the top oil producer. You know, shale oil is a manufacturing process. It's changed the whole thing. And that was a total misfocus. Um, and we messed up the onboarding of China and Russia. So um, getting back to the specific thing is that um, up to two days before the invasion, uh, Putin was asking Biden whether or not they would take NATO off the table. He said, no, NATO's on the table and it would remain so. And um, under the uh, assumption that Putin wouldn't invade and he did invade. And so um, we had a you know, regional war that's kicked in and um, it's bogging down. The light kind of force that he thought that he was going to do is more of a punitive, maybe uh, uh, you know, a, a fast operation ended up getting bogged down. U Ukrainian military had proved a lot. They have a lot of PGMs, a lot of drones. That's made it much more effective. Um, it slowed down that uh, light force. That light force was far too small, as many people have pointed out, for taking over Ukraine and in, in, in the kind of uh, overwhelming force kind of approach that, that the US used with Iraq. Should have been about 600,000 men instead of you know, under 200,000. Um, and now we're in this, and, and they also did some weird stuff in terms of keeping the uh, information uh, conduits up, keeping the communications channels open, um, allowing information that was going on in the ground to get back out. Um, and that had an interesting uh, dynamic. It changed the dynamic of, of the coverage of the war and our reaction to it. So um, I've been working on a, on a concept of warfare since woo, 2004 or so, wrote a book on it, Brave New War. Um, it's called Open Source Warfare. And um, the idea is that in a, in a connected environment, uh, you'll, you can see networks emerge and they act as decision-making systems. And these networks focus in on a very specific goal. And, you know, I call that the plausible promise right out of open source software development. Um, the plausible promise serves as a focus to allow a lot of disparate uh, groups and individuals to join together, even though they have different motivations, even though they may not get along with each other in the same room, they may be you know, uh, actively hostile, in fact, but they can come together to advance that single goal. And open source networks, uh, open source insurgency, open source warfare, I saw a really good example of that in the Iraq war, covered that, found that there were 70 different groups in Iraq, um, all coordinating sharing innovations and um, running a, a very effective uh, guerrilla war against the Americans um, in Iraq uh, that lasted you know, multiple years, did an incredible amount of damage. Um, it was completely different from what was expected in you know, standard counterinsurgency operations, you know, shook everybody, um, but this accounted for how it operated. Also, that you know, this networks and open source networks are are strange. They're different. They're they're different kind of decision making system than we're used to. Um, that we have a vocabulary for. Uh, there's coordination mechanisms. There's ways of, of of by which it operates that are different from standard practice. It's very similar to what we had back in you know when the printing press hit. You know, it made possible bureaucracies. It made possible uh, large financial markets. Uh, markets of all types. Uh, it changed the way we approach uh, tribalism as a decision-making system. It created nationalism. And it took many, many years to kind of get our hands and arms around those organizational types, those decision-making systems. Um, and um, a lot of the misfires were incredibly terrible. Now, like, for instance, in say, World War II, I mean, the, the whole genocide operation was a bureaucratic act activity. But we found out that bureaucracies don't have any inherent moral character. It's imposed from the outside. So they can become extremely efficient at killing and doing horrible stuff. I mean, so those are the kind of horrific kinks that can come out of a, a decision-making system that's not bounded. So you have the United States that has a mix of decision-making systems now. Uh, David Ronfeld calls it the Timmin framework. It's, it really works nice. Um, 
you know, we use uh, bureaucracies for the government, but we use a market mechanism to select the leader of the bureaucracy. Uh, we have markets, but we use the bureaucracy to manage at least bound the markets. So it's all a, a very mixed kind of a organizational system. So what we saw in um, with the Iraq, uh, with the uh, uh, invasion in Ukraine is that a global open source network emerged like overnight. Um, and it was the first time I've ever seen something hit at least in the in the in in, the, in terms of open source networks, open source warfare um, hit at the global level. Uh, we've had global, we've had open source protests. We had the whole Arab Spring where you had the uh, Egypt and Tunisia fell to open source protests where you had disparate groups come together to topple governments. We had uh, even in Puerto Rico, the you know uh, getting rid of uh, Ricky was like that was an open source protest. Uh, We've seen it in, pro in, in politics too. To a certain extent, the Trump insurgency in politics was an open source framework. It was dynamic. It wasn't because of the incredible organization of the Trump campaign machine. It was that there were so many people working on innovations and he was selecting the disruptions out of that, that machine and, and using them. So in this case, we had a open source network emerge for an interesting set of factors. Um, I broke it down into, into, into three pieces. Uh, there was this FOCO, which comes out of guerrilla warfare, Che Guevara and, and before, um, this group of committed people who were very good at igniting things and they were hair trigger. I mean, a good FOCO is a, uh, they would start a revolution. They would start an insurgency movement. In this case, they started an open source network. Uh, they were good at providing the initial impetus. They were hair triggered for this. Um, in this case, it, I think the, the network FOCO was um, the resistance network in the United States that focused in on Trump and, and conflated or, or mixed Trump and Putin as the ultimate evil, ultimate bad guy. Um, and that when Trump, when, uh, excuse me, when Putin invaded Ukraine, it proved them right and that they went into action. And that came to the second piece is that they created a promise out of this, it, is that we should under no holds barred reverse this invasion. And they were lucky enough at the time because of all the communications networks still being up in, in Ukraine is they got all the fodder and all the information they needed in terms of pictures and, and posts and, and other information necessary to spin it up into that narrative. Um, and that became the promise, at least the initial promise. Uh, and then the second piece is that it has to be a plausible promise. It can't be, uh, I'm going to go out and protest and immediately the government shuts it down and everyone's arrested. I mean, and then it clears the streets. That's not a plausible protest. And this, it's not a plausible movement. In this case, uh, the idea that, that Ukraine could be defended was proven out by the slowness of the Russian invasion and that uh, there was uh, uh, Zelensky and, and a, you know, kind of pushing, being that charismatic figure and then creating, you know, everyone amplifying that, creating that charisma and creating that uh, larger than life kind of figure, that resistance, the, uh, the, the elements that went into that created the plausibility that they could actually win or there was some viability in that. And since then it kept on spooling. So you had a plausible promise, you, you had the uh, network FOCO kicking into gear. And then the ascent phase of this as it kept on going global was uh, what we've seen a lot in these big open source networks is that they um, are very uh, focused on correcting injustice. So you have injustice at the small scale and that they will bring everything to bear to focus on fixing that injustice, even if it's to a single individual and bring the whole nation down. In this case, the whole world focused on correcting this uh, injustice in this regional war. And that network got very, very big and the, and the focus, the promise changed over time. And that is becoming increasingly focused on um, eliminating the threat, 
which is Putin. And now over time, it's become Russia as the threat. Um, that the way the networks usually work is a combination of disruption, which is a kind of maneuver war. Um, and then there's also disconnection. And Peter's like, I got to say something. What? No, you're just stretching. Okay. Um, and so disruption is like hacking. It's like uh, information warfare. It's, it's spinning up narratives, even you know, taking stuff from movies and, and, and creating characters that are like uh, kind of get people hyped up on the defense of, of Ukraine and the terribleness of the Russians. Uh, and the um, disconnection uh, is a standard go-to. We saw it most recently in the uh, trucker protest. Um, that was an open source movement coming up, and it was it was slammed by the government and and and, and kind of an open source counter protest that figured out all these different ways to actually disconnect the protesters. Uh, means uh, you basically become unpersoned, but they're applying this to nuclear power. Uh, there's what the government's doing, and there's what corporations are doing below that, going above and beyond. There are people. And then there's what everyone at different layers of governance all the way down to the local. Uh, there's what individuals are doing, all focused on disconnecting a nuclear power. And that's the problem here. And that gets us into the situation we're in right now. We have this open source network that is running at light speed that disconnected effectively Russia in about two, three days. It's going far above what any coalition's ever done in history. I mean, there's no way that Biden or the EU or anyone could coordinate all the cats that are focused on this um, and do it at a global scale. And it's escalating a conflict with a, uh, with a nuclear power. And when I would say nuclear power, I was, you know, it's important to point out that you know, when Russia, when the USSR fell, Russia retained the nukes and Russia has more nukes than everybody else. They still have 6,000 nuclear weapons. U.S. has five, and China has about 300. So Russia is kind of crown jewels, what it confers it, a lot of what they consider they, they, they deserve is respect is that they have those nukes. And um, this open source network attacking them upsets a lot of the old uh, methods and conventions that we've had uh, in place in the past to prevent escalation in nuclear war. Um, you know, we kept the world safe for 80 years and prevented a World War III. And there's been messy wars here and there, but there hasn't been a World War III that killed hundreds of millions, if not billions, um, or a World War IV that would probably have come after that that killed hundreds of millions, if not billions, because we figured out a way to prevent escalation to thermonuclear war. Between and all during the, the Cold War, there was an etiquette that developed. Uh, in fits and starts, um, and a lot of it had to do with not engaging directly in, in the same conflict between the nuclear powers, never having your, your forces fight head to head, um, and um, recognizing that if the other side is all in to committed to doing something, that you may not have any option other than to just watch it happen. You can fight on the margins, fight on the on the underside, uh, but if you went to go directly engage with them over it, uh, you would inevitably push it to uh, a nuclear war. Um, even if both sides didn't want to, it's just a series of mistakes and blunders and counter moves and an inability to back down that drives you in that direction. So he, here we are, we have Russia now in two, three days, uh, has basically been disconnected up to the level that we see with North Korea, we see with Iran, and it is a powerful country with 6,000 nukes, and it's disconnected from the global system. It reminds me of something, uh, um, the head of uh, BlackRock, that big financial firm, the biggest financial firm, but controls about $14 trillion worth of money. He goes, everyone always asked him, you know, do you worry about Russia? Do you worry about what it's going to do here or there? He goes, no, I, I'm not worried. I see their money in my system, right? If As long as they're connected and stay connected, they won't go too far. And um, we're disconnecting them. We're, we're making them completely into pariah state. 
down through the individuals that potentially could influence the situation. Um, so that's that's the nut of it. it. You know, we have a network in charge of the response to Russia and Russia's you know authoritarian dictatorship. Putin has very few controls on him in regards to the use of nuclear weapons and military force. Not like in the United States and other places, which are a lot of safeguards. Um, and we have you know on our side is this sprawling network that's maximalist, that is escalating without controls. There's no way to turn it off. You can't just go up to this network and say, it's time to turn it off. If you, if you say it, even I've been saying it, is that people will get mad at you and like tune you out or tune, you know, yell you down. So um, it's, a, it's a very, very scary moment in history. And that's the gist of the report. There's a lot more details in it, but um, it's pretty much uh, the basic of it, basis of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great uh, summary. Uh, and we have a bunch of uh, awesome questions in the chat. Uh, there's just uh, perhaps one or two I wanted to ask you. Uh, there's a tweet that you, um, there's a few tweets that uh, I, I like that one that you said is, if Putin's goal was to disconnect Russia from the West, he hit the jackpot. Um, and I'm curious what your take and models are on um, what Russia and Putin's uh, strategy was and pre preparation if they had any for uh, this sort of a uh, swarm attack that that they're facing right now, I don't think they had any idea that you'd they'd face an open source network like this. Um, I think, well, this is the first really you know this is the first major test since the end of the Cold War of you know nuclear power politics and and um, I mean global open source warfare is new. It's a new thing. It's absolutely. I mean. Novelty and nuclear weapons just don't mix. It's not, it's not a healthy thing to have. Um, and they didn't anticipate it. And the folks in the West don't, didn't anticipate it either. In fact, they're probably you know, deluding themselves that they're actually the ones who are running it. You know, could, oh, look how great a job we're doing, right? Rather than saying, hell, this is out of control. You know, this is like going way beyond you know, any kind of mitigation efforts that we, we you know, we don't want to like completely disconnect them. We want to partially disconnect them, make it painful. We don't want to precipitate something worse. Um, yeah, I mean, and then the, the Putin side, I mean, there's a, you know, a large body of thought. I mean, I was thinking about actually doing a, a report on Dugan this month. I did a report on Wang Huning last month and, and it came up with a kind of a, I think kind of original take on his stuff because it's like we're thinking the same thing. <laughs> you know, when I'm reading Hening, I was like, wow, this guy's, you know, he gets a good portion of it. Um, is that they see the West as a very uh, self destructive, that there are forces at play that will cause it to blow up. Um, and that it will fall apart because the global system is throwing off so many uh, disruptions now, so many um, events that destabilize the system. And there's, the system isn't really good at dealing with those uh, events, as we've seen from COVID and all the way back, all these, this perma crisis that we've been seeing since 9-11, uh, since, uh, um, is that um, the what they see is a lack of social cohesion or so you know cultural cohesion that's necessary to actually handle the you know the stresses of that environment and both are working on ways of try to create the cultural cohesion necessary to operate in the environment uh, china is trying to do it through kind of a network coercion effect to keep everything cohesive so in a way that would allow them to continue to operate a free market economy and innovate and russia has got a, a, a a little bit more of a back to basics, you know, kind of approach with Dugan. Um, so the thinking was among those folks, the people, you know, who think like that is that disconnection allows Russia to get back to its roots and will force them to get back to the roots. Um, but disconnection of a country that's been connected as, as deeply and, and, and profoundly as, as Russia has in um, virtually every, every country has at this point, um, it's going to be a lot more traumatic than they anticipate. So um, sometimes, you know, beware what you wish for, right? So 
I don't think his focus was, I don't think he could have imagined this level of disconnection. I don't think that was his goal. But I mean, I was just kind of satirically pointing out that if it was his goal, he hit the jackpot. Awesome, awesome. Um, and uh, uh, maybe I read another quick tweet that you had. Uh, if we had the current uh, leadership in the West during the 50s, we'd never have made it out of the 50s alive. And um, yeah, just like having this in the perma crisis, having um, you know, nuclear warfare on, on the consciousness again, it's like, oh, I, I don't really like the idea of the current batch of politicians in this you know, open source network uh, having access, uh, you know, to this stuff. And so it's kind of terrifying. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm curious if you can speak on that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, focus more on the, on the mindset of the folks that want to figure out how to get things done and keep the world stable and, and peaceful um, and, and do it in a way that doesn't ignite the war, it doesn't ignite the war that ends it all. And, I, and learning to, to think within the con, you know, think within constraints, that there are constraints out there. And um, I think a lot of people in leadership positions today don't think there are any constraints, that if enough people want it to happen, it's going to happen. It's this network rewiring effect is that if we all focus this network on this problem, there's no way that, that anyone's going to be able to do anything different. Um, though, you know, I don't think the model of the conflict, I just, okay, so that problem solving model, mindset that you know the people that had been through world war ii actually knew what war and destruction and and, and uh, miscalculation looked like and trying to figure out a way through that in the 50s now in terms of the model of the conflict i think it's more like world war one than two is that you have all of these connections and you have a new decision making system the uh, this network decision making system out there um, ramping things up and that we all kind of cheer it on and blunder into the conflict. Now with World War I, it was treaties. It was, you know, a, they were surprised at the scale and the ferocity of the conflict because they had just started using modern bureaucratic machinery to mobilize a nation. I mean, how do you get 10 million men, you know, recruited, trained, armed and into the field? Um, and, uh, how do you finance what well the big financial markets were just starting out and the us didn't even have a a a, a federal tax until just before that so uh, just before the war so you know taxation on scale uh, global financial markets able to finance massive armies and they were anticipating the kind of wars that they saw in the 1800s and they got a war or in the 1900s in the 20th century that was completely different on a scale that they never anticipated because those decision-making systems, those organizational systems worked far more effectively than they ever anticipated. So both the kind of being pulled in uh, through kind of this euphoria, uh, lack of experience, the uh, belief that the, that the conflict is gonna be a lot less uh, dramatic than in, you know than they anticipated um anyway you know world war one is i think is, is a good model for this all right so this is a kind of big downer session right <laughs> i mean it's like uh, yeah when you see it it like just floors you just like knocks you out and you just go wow and there's no one to turn it off mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it, it feels like uh, i was talking to a friend it's like a black mirror episode but like you know uh real life yeah in the global scale um so we have a lot of uh questions in the chat so we're not going to do the hand option um and we're not going to go in order uh and again if you don't want to be on youtube just indicate that or if you say something that you want me to edit out after you can email me here or you can just ask me to pause the recording and i can pause it uh, when you speak uh in order for us to really get uh some good shares in uh, so Gil, you had a, a question. If you can unmute yourself and ask it. Gil, are you there? Thank you, Peter. Yeah. yeah. Peter, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, Gil. And, and John, thank you. Hi. <clears throat> um, two related questions. Uh, I, I appreciate that you talked about the elaborate control and stand down mechanisms that we developed during the Cold War. 
uh, it seems that by their nature, open source networks don't have that and can't do that. Uh, so how do you envision uh, either this kind of, you know, this kind of fervent open source network standing down or being persuaded to stand down? Related question is if you were POTUS, how would you have played this 10 days ago uh, or today? Uh, fa you know, facing the risks that you're talking about, which is that, you know, a cornered bear is a very dangerous thing. Right. Uh, what are the what are the options that you saw were missed or that may be apparent now? And I'll I'll go offline now and listen. Thank you. Right. Yep. Um, I was less enthusiastic about expanding NATO up to Russia's borders. I mean, I, it's been accelerated recently, and I think I think they accelerated it with Ukraine. In, in no small part to punish them for perceived uh, interference in our elections and for Trump. And that, um, you know, it was a misread to kind of push it and keep it on the table all the way up through. So I would have done that if I was, if I was POTUS at the time, but okay, assume that I did and it didn't take it off the table and, and the, um, the war started. Uh, I would have known, I mean, if I, you know, knowing what I know, I would, I was still surprised that it went to a global level this quick, but I, I could recognize it when it happened. And they certainly don't know. Um, remember, we're operating with frameworks that 20 years from now probably will be standard for people to think through this issue, think through what happened. Um, like describing social networking back in 96, right? Wrote a report on it. Well, people thought it was popular, it was cool, but they're like, what the heck are you talking about, right? So it's like, okay takes another decade or so for the, the thing to work through. Um, what to do about it? Now he's doing the right thing in terms of holding back the pressure to do uh, direct involvement, right? Um, you know, sending uh, NATO forces into Ukraine, uh, you know, putting over uh, uh, no-fly zones and the like, that's not something that we wanna do. That's a, like a, a immediate step to escalation. Um, and that, um, but the pressure is increasing by the day and, and the bloodier it gets and the, and the more bombardment that happens, the network keeps on eroding and, you know, kind of reason and, and rational thinking that, that leaders in, in, inside NATO um, in other places had before the conflict initiated and that they've, I think they're going to increasingly put pressure on, on NATO to, to, to do that. You know, if, um, well, if there wasn't that pressure, I mean, if, if, NATO, if NATO doesn't, I was going to say, if NATO doesn't do that, then Biden and NATO are going to be denounced for losing Ukraine and for the matter to be there. And if they do the no fly zone, we risk Putin launching missiles, right? That's the yeah. dilemma. Yeah, no, a no fly zone or, or US or NATO troops inside of the borders of Ukraine would be uh, an immediate escalatory event and probably lead to new tactical nukes very, very quickly. And that goes duh, 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 all the way up. And then um, what you can do, and there's lots of ways to do it around the margins. Um, and maybe in the future, we might be doing this uh, is that you give them drones, flag them Ukraine, Ukrainian and um, base them in in country, and you fly them with U.S. pilots remotely, and that kind of gives you a kind of a, a, a deniability in terms of deploying stuff. But you know, we did that in uh, Russia did did that in, in Korea, but that was when um, you know that was a different time frame. Right, and that was a you know it, it was a very risky maneuver, and we're still learning kind of the etiquette of, of actually doing this. Um, we can give them weapons. We are, uh, we could help them fight a guerrilla war. We can fight the conventional war while they're doing it. We we're doing that, but it all has to be done on on the on the underside. I don't know if there's any really good way to slow down the network from disconnecting Russia, um, because it's doing it's on its own. Like for instance, uh, and and the leaders are all kind of one upping each other. We saw Johnson just today is like talking about uh, let's shut off all Russian oil and gas. You know, just like, let's shut it down. 
uh, and that uh, we'll stop payment for it and to make that happen. But um, you know, he was trying to innovate and share that and get people to adopt it and build up support for that uh, uh, among uh, the countries. But um, you know, what's, what's already happening is that 70% uh, of the Russian oil that's available for sales not even being bought is that everyone is shutting off demand at the corporate level. It's automatically ha just happening. And it's not because they're, they're prohibited from doing it. They just don't want to do it because it's against what this network wants. So um, I don't know how you stop it at this point. Uh, you can keep the rhetoric uh, even keeled. Um, you could help Zelensky you know, negotiate some kind of uh, deal. And I think yesterday he was talking about um, meeting with Putin and talking, focusing in on neutrality and independence, which I think at this point may actually be playable by Russia, but it would require not joining NATO or EU. And I think right after he said that or, or implied that, that he got all these calls from people, leaders saying, don't do that, toe the line, keep on fighting. We'll keep on supporting you. So um, helping them get to the negotiation table may help. You know, also my worry is that the, the network won't shut off. You know, as this keeps on going, you know, even if uh, uh, the conflict in Ukraine is, is resolved, that in some way, uh, even, even if the Russia withdrew its troops, that uh, the disconnection effort focused on Russia won't end. They'll keep the pressure up. And, and the focus and the, and the promise would be uh, Putin removed from office. And the potentially even after that uh, nuclear disarmament. If you want back into the global community, you got to get rid of the nukes. And that seems like really aggressive, but we're talking, if you, you're not going to be a threat to us anymore if you want to be part of us. So, um, and that's not going to happen. But, you know, it, there's, I don't think a Russian alive would, would bite on that. So um, that's where we're at. A network that's maximalist that won't stop, that'll get more and more ambitious in, in, in focusing on the tribal existential enemy and won't let it go. Wow. Um... All right, thanks, Gil. Uh, we'll stick with one follow-up question or one follow-up share after the initial question. And um, Vinny, you had a question. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if you think there's similar kind of swarm activity coming out of Russia. So maybe perhaps it starts kind of top down, but then it kind of disperses into this network, which may partially even be located in the US. You know, like for context, I've been seeing um, what seem like Western accounts and maybe kind of classically sort of QAnon accounts spreading sort of pro-Russia stories. Um, and to me that, you know, I don't know where that fits into this, this model that you're building. Yeah, no, uh, you know, Russia is gonna use, you know, concept of maneuver warfare when you take it online is, is uh, disruption. So you're really trying to disrupt and you're, and they can't, you know, exert the kind of moral pressure that you're seeing, you know, moral warfare, guerrilla warfare, you know, that we're seeing with the, the network as a whole and in you know, the Western, you know, open source network. Um, but they're outgunned. It's not even close. I mean, it's like comparing, okay, so all of the squawking about Russian interference in, in, in the US election, you know, trying to, you know, do things online through social media. And, and they did a lot of stuff, but if you've read it or looked at it, it was ham fisted, it was terrible. And that the volume of that, it wasn't even a rounding error compared to the stuff that was being produced on a daily basis. You know, so we're talking billions of page views a day being produced out of the United States and maybe, you know, a couple hundred thousand a day or less than that, tens of thousands a day out of Russia. It's like, it's lost in the, it, it's a rounding error. It's not even, it's not even a rounding error. It's not even in, in this. And the same thing is with this is when you go head to head, They've not only um, not only outgunned; they're being suppressed and 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 disconnected and, and muted. Um, I don't see any meaningful competition. I do see on the Western side, and we see this with every time this this open source network stands up, this this you know 
cohesive thing, exerting moral pressure, is that there's a um, dissent start standing up or people going, you know, asking, hey, is what you're saying actually true or what we're doing is actually right? Um, and um, I mean, that stood up to COVID measures and kind of that's the kind of yin and yang and the network politics is that you have the network that tries to create a solution to something and, and enforces it and pushes it. Um, and that over time, that thing loses uh, viability, the conditions change or the, uh, or the, or it goes too far and that there has to be a dissent function to actually stand up against it and kind of question it uh, to turn it off eventually to, you know, in terms of COVID is to turn off the masking eventually even though that we didn't get to zero COVID. So um, problem in a war, wartime environment that that stuff could actually be shut off and they will lose the dissent function or you'll push it so far to the margins that it's not even heard or, or allowed to hear because if you say anything that's contrary to the general narrative, the tribal kind of open source narrative is that um, you're an enemy, you're part of the enemy, even questioning, you know? You're, you're a Russophile or you're supporting Putin, and I'm certainly not either. So um, anyway, that's the, that's the uh, kind of dynamic. There has to be that thing. But uh, yeah, Putin and his, his folks, they're not even in the same league. Any follow-up uh, question or share of any? No, I'm good, thanks. All right. Uh, Eric, did you have a, a question? Oh, um, thank you. Um, no, not a particular question. Mostly I was just um, saying I appreciate the comparisons towards uh, World War I. I thought that was uh, at, er, insightful on in so many levels. That's all I had, sir. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the uh, elimination or the regime change or getting rid of, a, of Putin through assassination um, then create, you know, it could create a power struggle. It could, could create a dynamic that's actually even more out of control than we're, we're currently experiencing. I mean, we got really lucky with it, the fall of the Soviet Union. I mean, in so many, so many ways. I mean, that, that could have gone bad in, in many, many ways. And we just got lucky. And you can't rely on luck all the time. You don't want to create situations where you have to rely on luck to, to save humanity. There shouldn't even be kind of any kind of measure of that it should be okay let's keep on um, working within set boundaries and get things done uh laszlo you had a question uh yeah let's um well, let's not make any assumptions about uh, Putin's uh, sanity, but uh, let's assume that he's not dumb and he could have seen uh, coming from a while away that there was going to be economic sanctions and different kinds of restrictions on Russia. Do is that to either his advantage or Russia's advantage as a whole? Like is an advantage to him where any of his opponents who would have offshore assets and money outside of Russia are now cut off from the resources? Or is there like more of an advantage towards Russia where they get to be weaned off of the global system and maybe they wanna be weaned off SWIFT and then start a different system? Like, I'm just wondering, maybe that's not the goal of going into Ukraine, but it had to have been a side effect. Is that playing into some kind of a game that he's playing that he's thinking 10, 15 years in the future from now? Yeah, I mean, he was somewhat prepared after his experience of 2014 with Crimea where sanctions went into place. Um, so they took measures to kind of mitigate that built up a stockpile, created new investments and, 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 and put money into China, uh, ramped up their China trade, uh, trying to you know, hedge themselves against you know, sanctions from the West. Um, but uh, I don't think he was expecting anything. He, you know, he, he thought that he would, as Russia, as a nuclear power of, of that stature, would be can, you know, given the, the standard um, courtesy or, you know, not courtesy so much as the uh, deference in regards to certain actions um, that are considered, you know, extremely close to Russia's national security. 
So it, it, it's part of that whole nuclear power politics thing is that the things that are closely held to the, your opponent, you don't want to mess with. And uh, that he thought he could get the operation done quickly and that uh, resolved uh, whatever his outcome was, is whether it's going to take the eastern sections or, you know, the, you know where, where Russians live or uh, Russian speakers live, or he was going to go for the whole thing and set up a puppet state. But I don't think he was going to do that because of, I don't think it would have been controllable. Um, but given the previous experience, is that um, he thought he could resolve that and then work his way back out of those limited sanctions over time, get back and use the energy uh, uh, lever he has to kind of get back into that. And um, that didn't work out. It's not working out this time. And I don't, I don't think he's, uh, he anticipated this and it's, it, it's, it's going to hurt Russia a lot more than he ever imagined. And you just don't switch an economy. There's not enough trade right now with China alone and what he can do on the pirate economy, even if he's making 400 million a year on, on ransomware and, and crap like that uh, to power the economy the size of Russia, particularly as energy has to be radically discounted in order to be sold. So um, it's just not enough. There's, even if you had it, now you can't even buy the products you want. They have to be smuggled in. If you want to buy an Apple iPhone, you can't get it unless you get it smuggled in. Uh, it's just, it's just nuts, you know, in terms of how disconnected they've become. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. That will give me something to chew over over the weekend unless another historical pivot point drops in on us. <laughs> like daily, right? Every couple of hours, there's another one. Yeah. Wouldn't be too surprised. Um, all right. Uh, Steve, you had a, a question. Did you want to ask it? Is that me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, thank you, Peter, for doing this. Um, John, you had a, one of the one of the conversations you had recently. Something struck me where you said um, one of the questions that I asked got answered, I thought. So thank you, Peter. Um, but you had said that people whose virtual ident whose identity was sort of vir was virtual were leaving um, and heading west from Ukraine and that struck me. And so there's a couple of cases I kind of buy that this is the great wall falling the other way and there could be a disconnect. What you said with Putin rebuilding the body of Russia. Another Russian referred to that as the house of Russia and Kiev was a foundation. Um, and then the, the, but the people streaming West, if they're disconnected does that tribal identity of disconnect online, does that only work for people who are virtual? In other words, in the West? Um, because uh, uh, like Turchin's work talks about nations being built on war. And if this is a war, we could have another wall there. Where my interest is, is within here, because I, I, if, if all this resolves, we still have to deal with that, this in, let's say, America. And right. there's, right? So there's an aspect that I'm calling sixth generation warfare here. Let me give you two cases. One is that somebody who was unvaccinated went into the emergency room and doctors were heard laughing about wheezing. And if those doctors then at that time go to lunch, we have a way in which not only can you tell who's not the enemy, it's somebody who's supposed to help you, but in fact, they harm you. There's also somebody drunk called me and we were talking about who died and they said, yeah, well, a couple of my relatives died from COVID, but they deserved it. They were unvaccinated. So it's concerns. Okay. So concerns. two different things here. Yeah, Go ahead. I mean, Thank the, you. I'm yeah, done. No, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It, there's two different pieces here. Um, I'm working through the idea of this like virtual tangible divide. You can see it in the, it was a concept that I, I, I read recently. Um, I don't know if it's a nom de guerre on the, on, on the, the account, but it, it was actually, a, I've listed it a couple of places. It was a great article. And, it, and um, it's the people who, the virtuals are people who I, uh, it, and it's largely generational. It's, it's younger people who live on the internet and they are completely rewired um, mentally. I mean, McLuhan would have us, you know, we're, 
we're being rewired by the medium that we're using. And um, this one moves us from kind of a deep contextual thinking like you would do if you're reading a book to pattern matching um, and you know, radical pattern. The only way you can handle the volume of information you deal with on a daily basis is to pick out the pieces and that those patterns are prefabbed, right? They're, they're uh, communal patterns. They're not something that you build on your own. And um, virtuals are uh, very warlike online. They're very aggressive on the whole. And I, from what I've seen and what we're seeing, um, but they're vulnerable to the physical tangibles uh, in the real world. And um, because I don't think a lot of the virtuals actually want to fight physically. They won't put themselves personally at risk, put their lives at risk. Um, and we saw that, I mean, I, I, it's just an early observation. I saw, I think I saw a little bit of that in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the population doubled in 20 years from the time, you know, the invasion happened to the time uh, the Taliban took back over. Um, so it was a nation of young people and that um, a lot of them had grown up in the environment where they were completely virtual and their, their objectives and their career aspirations and what they thought about themselves was in this virtual abstract space. Uh, and they didn't show up. So when the, you know, a small, relatively small group of guys with guns came, you know, out of the fields, out of the, the physical background environment, they weren't there to fight and defend and you know, they had all the weapons available to them that they could possibly ever want, but they didn't show up to fight. And um, they were like, save us. You know, why aren't you coming in and fighting and, 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 and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that's, that's a kind of an interesting thing. What you see also in the, in the virtual environment is a lot of uh, tribal dynamics. One of the ways that this thing takes, you know, uh, open source network grows is through what I call empathic triggers or empathy triggers. An empathy trigger is, um, you see, saw it in BLM. So you have that video uh, of him being arrested with a you know, knee on his neck. And that gives you a sense of connection to that, you know, to, to, the, to the victim. And um, you, you know, that empathy is triggered because you're in pattern matching a lot of the things that you normally would have in terms of filters to prevent you from um, automatically triggering an empathic reaction um, aren't there. Like if you're walking down the street and you see somebody asking you for money, you don't necessarily have an empathy trigger. Um, you, can, you can control it. And even if you give money, it's like a controlled kind of thing. Whereas online, a lot of times when you see something, you, you can get that empathy automatically triggered. And that connection that you build is in some cases, a kind of a, a fictive kinship, a, a kind of a way of connecting with them um, at a very deep level. Uh, empathy isn't like sympathy, it's actually mental modeling. So based on the cues of the behavior that you're seeing and the way that person is thinking is that you model it into your own mind. So you feel that knee on your neck, you feel the, you know, if you're, somebody's getting electrocuted, you're grimacing or something horrible is happening. You feel that tension. If they're angry or outraged as a result, you feel that anger and that outrage. Um, and that connection creates a tribal connection. Um, and tribalism um, online isn't really an empathy online isn't really uh, just in group out group it can quickly become you know you know my tribal brethren i you know any assault on you is a, by somebody outside is a attack by somebody who's a, a tribal enemy uh, normal in group out groups with empathy is like you feel for this group and you don't feel for that that group that group is kind of dehumanized and when you add the whole kind of tribal dynamic to it, it becomes, you're not only not feeling for that outgroup, you, you hate them, you despise them, and, and that you want to do them harm. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of, you know, virtual tribalism is a, shows up a lot. We saw it a little bit in COVID, like you were mentioning. Um, we're gonna see it again. We're, seeing, we're gonna see it here with this network. 
Thank hope you. that was understandable. We could we could have a whole set. We I think we had had sessions on that in the past, but uh, where we dug into that. But thank you, John. Um, Tolly, you had a question. Yeah. Um, hi guys. Hi John. Hi. Thanks uh, for doing this. <clears throat> I have a very selfish question. Um, so uh, this is already a global conflict, but we can say that for the West, at least, it's not a global crisis yet. But assuming it does turn into a global crisis, nuclear or not, there I, I see there are two conversations, two types of conversations to be had. One is kind of the conversation we're having is what should the world do? The other conversation, which is quite different, is what should I do? Uh, for example, in January 2020, we have the COVID crisis looming. Um, I just joined your Patreon, uh, John, and uh, I, I went to check, like, was John early on COVID? And you were. You were on top of it in January. So I'm like, all right, cool. But you were looking at it from the perspective, like, what's it going to do with China, right? You weren't thinking about me. What's it going to do, do for me? And uh, back then, we could talk about shutdowns, contract, contact tracing. Uh, but that's about what should the world do? The other what should I do conversation, well, I should short the market, right? I should find a sweet deal on a property on the beach somewhere away from everyone else at least for before, before all those things go, go away on Airbnb and whatnot. Um, so now with this conflict, I, I feel like we're in a similar situation. Um, if it's really heading to a deep, dark place, um, we can be talking about what the world should do. And a lot of it, we can be fatalistic, we can be hopeful. I'm curious to know, are you interested in the question of what should I do? Right? Should, should I join a prepper community? Should I? Right. Um, because I've been thinking, you know, I was thinking about my startup a week ago, but after reading your report, I'm thinking about, you know, the baby that's on the way and uh, where should I be living so I don't get nuked? Right? right. Is, that, is that the wrong thought to be having right now? Or, yeah, um, it's a tough one. I mean, Okay, so like I said, it is like when you're looking, you're trying to be ahead, right? Mm -hmm. And I was trying to learn from, like, for instance, in January 2020, you know, writing that pandemic report, is I was trying to learn from what was going on in China and, and getting a sense of how it's going to come here. Um, and it takes a while to kind of figure out all that other stuff. I mean, I, we got to a lot of what you do later, right? Uh, yeah, and that uh, it just it, it took a time to actually think that through. Uh, it's like a lot of these concepts. Somebody was like, "Oh, well, you could take you know you could think it out and and stress test it and and you know, take open source warfare and go through all these things." I go, but when you're really early, who's going to like do all that stress testing? I mean, it's like it, you got to wait till a lot of other people hop on board and see it as the thing that 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 is useful to describe this current situation and they'll rename it. They'll re, you know, redo it and they'll talk about it in, in academic forums and on and on and on. Um, they'll do all that stress testing and, and argument. So, um, okay. So we have some concepts, got a, a sense for where this is headed. It's a little, it's a little early, actually a lot early compared to where, where a lot of people are going to be. Um, and what can you do with nuclear weapons and nuclear warfare? And I've, I don't know, I've been thinking about oh, nuclear warfare. By the way, there's no right answer to my question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so don't no, worry. No. Just, what do you it, do? It's more of a question about a question. I'm curious if your mind even goes there. Are you thinking about yourself at all? It's, it's not about me, but like, are you thinking about the individual? Or is it more in the, not so much the abstract, but in this global power and and how civilization is changing, whether we survive or not, not that important. Or <laughs> is there like a practical part to what you're thinking of like, well, well, should I be sending like messages to my tribe to maybe, you know, have a car ready and packed or something like that? Right, okay, so um, when it's possible to be practical, I mean, I did the whole resilient community stuff when I saw the potential for kind of, uh, a wind down of the West. 
And we could we could see the initiating potentially with this and COVID and other things that things start breaking, you know, like supply chains start breaking and, and things don't get delivered and things don't work. Um, we're not producing any more energy than we produced five years ago and the blackouts have doubled already and it's getting potentially worse as, as we go down. So building a resilient community to kind of weather the storm that's coming. Um, and learned a lot about, you know, what it takes to actually produce the food and the energy and everything else that needs to be done. I did a whole report series on that stuff. It gets tougher with nuclear warfare. And I, I thought a lot about it, but boy, it's like, since I was in high school, so it was like been forever, right? My first report in high school was, was about nuclear power politics and warfare. And um, I've come to the point, at least in my life, that I don't think I can out game it or I can figure out a place that I end up, that if it goes strategic, that there will be so much disruption and that you don't necessarily know where you, you know, where it's going to, where the targets are going to be, where the damage is going to be. Um, and trying to outrun it would be very, very difficult or, you know, game it. Um, I'm in New, uh, New England, so, you know, there's really not much, not, many uh, places I could go here that would get me far enough away, maybe upper, upper state, Maine. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, would you want to live in a post-nuclear environment with radiation clouds and uh, with all the you know, lack of anything um, and the violence that would come after that? And we've seen enough movies and seen enough speculation on what would what would be after that. So, um, oh, I've just kind of taken the approach, at least with nuclear wef weapons and 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 strategic nuclear wep warfare, is that I just live my life as it is. And if I happen to be uh, uh, unlucky to live on the time timeline that includes that, uh, that's just the breaks. I think I'm lucky enough not to personally. I've lived through a couple of airplane crashes as a pilot, and you know. I think it, I think we'll I'll be on the right one, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not worth the dislocation for me. You know, I can't tell my kids where to live. <laughs> you know, I can't tell them. You know, I don't have that much control to keep them all safe. Does that make any sense? I you know, I wish I, I wish there was like a you know a go bag and stuff for civil problems or civil uh, unrest. And, and economic dislocation and, 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 and failure is one thing, you know, prepping and finding a location of, of like-minded individuals to kind of get you through that, that's one thing, but a nuclear war, too many variables. That's all I got for that. <laughs> you know, uh, thanks, Tolly. I have a follow-up question um, on that. Do you, do you have a, another, uh, like 15, 20 minutes, John? Uh, to the yeah, sure. Um, do you know how they say like 99.9% .9 of species on Earth have went <laughs> extinct? Uh, um, so we're probably going to go extinct as well, um, if not with the uh, nuclear holocaust, something else probably. But like, assuming we don't, you know, the two, uh, what they call the meta crisis, which is related to your perma crisis, like the two attractors there is a collapse scenario or totalitarianism, like the two kind of like worst case scenarios. And, um, you know, like the art of being like a prepper for either one of those scenarios. Um, and I'm curious, you talk a lot about the, the perma crisis that how it leads to a long night or could lead the trajectory of it leading to a long night scenario. So to the, the, the totalitarian trajectory of um, the detractor of the meta crisis. And um, like, how do you think, see this situation, assuming it doesn't lead to a nuclear war, like how would this situation interact with that trajectory? Well, so every event on the perma crisis accelerates development um, of the network. And there are elements of the network that are currently in process that are being, being worked on and that, uh, that come fruition over time. Um, and one of, those, one of those things that we're building is this social artifact, which is really just society as a technological artifact that uh, we can build it that in a way that allows a lot of freedom and, and, and uh, degrees of freedom and, and allows you know, individuals to 
make their own choices or we can lock it down. And um, like China is going to build, they're going to build a system that has a lot of, of, of limitations on what you can do and what you can't do and what you can, um, what society can do and can't do. My worry is that we're going to do it here. And then um, that's going to lock us down for a long, long time. And uh, that lockdown process, narrowing process of what's possible, what, what you can think, what you can say um, is stagnation. You know, it's uh, failure. It's um, going sideways forever. And uh, yeah, I don't think that's, I don't think that's something that, that is good for us long-term. And if it's locked into infrastructure with AIs and like it, it, it's very, very hard to eradicate and get out of. You know, I, I think there was a dividing line and, and I think we crossed it is that there was two different things, directions we could go. We could keep on going out and it be expansive and go into space and, and go into new areas or we could you know, collapse in on ourselves and navel gaze and constantly come up with new problems that we have to solve. Um, and that kind of collapse inward direction is where most of the attention is. And we're not focusing on expanding out. Like for instance, like you're looking at carbon and, and kind of energy problems and like, well, if we were expanding out, we'd be focused on getting space-based solar power going which is really isn't, it isn't incredibly difficult. I'm an astro engineer, but it's like, it's not incredibly difficult technology to implement. And it's the kind of thing that would get us enough power production, uh, carbon-free power production, potentially even built with resources that aren't even coming from the earth in space um, that could fuel us forever. Um, get us to what, you know, type one civilization, cap collecting as much, energy and utilizing it for our own purposes as the earth gets from the sun every day. But we're not even looking at that. There's not even a, uh, just a couple projects here and there are looking at it. It's just like, it shows that we're on this wind down phase. So um, yeah, this is, you know, just some thinking on my part. I, just hoping that we can get some rights and other things in place that will protect us against this lockdown of a long night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone suggested that this be a, a good, uh, another gorilla report. Um, so is it, uh, was it Mark? Uh, Mark, I think you had a question. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I, I was just, um pointing out that the effect of the network seems to have been to magnify the effect of the economic sanctions up to like, you know, much more extreme levels than what uh, they were intended to. And given that it's preferable to put pressure on Russia that way, as opposed to militarily, why is it bad that the network has amplified them to that extent? All right, well, um, turning Russia into North Korea overnight uh, gets us in a situation where they will take actions that are risky uh, to extract themselves from that situation. And um, I don't think they're going to you know, acquiesce to the network's demands. And there will be maximalist, maximalist demands, everything from, uh, as I mentioned, changing leadership, regime change, plus potentially disarming, at least on the nuclear front, um, and then other treaties to lock them down and lock them in place, is that um, that level of disconnection uh, forces them into a path of action that is uh, going to lead to future conflicts. That will be, uh, you'll have nuclear blackmail, and demands, uh, and um, we're gonna be forced into a situation in terms of responding to that, that could lead to a uh, nuclear exchange. That could, you know, at, at, at a minimum, destroy parts of Europe and at a maximum, you know, have a strategic exchange between the US and Russia. So um, 
no, I'd rather not have a nu you know, nuclear North Korea at that level um, that's in conflict with the West and, 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 and thinks they're wronged. I mean, there's a, there's, you know, nations have a, uh, um, there are some nations that are very prideful and, and, and aggressive when their pride has been damaged and, and Russia is one of those. Germany is another one of those. Um, and uh, that's a bad position for us to be in. Any follow-up question or share, Mark? Yeah, th thanks, John. I, I was kind of afraid you might answer it that way. I, <laughs> I, I understand your point well, thank you. Right, yeah, no, I'm, my problem also is that if I was in Russia's shoes and I was thinking like them, I could come up with a, a, at least 100 different ways to leverage my nuclear power and leverage my connection to cause incredible amounts of damage and, and that would allow me to get back into the system or at least parts of the system. And um, if I'm thinking like that, they're thinking like that too. So um, that scares me. I mean, it's hard to negotiate with the, uh, an amorphous network, so to speak. Yeah, you can't, <laughs> you just can't. Yeah. That's the scary part about it. It's just, you know, you can't turn it off. It just, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do well with partial success either. And what's the whole thing? Thank you. Yep. Uh, Nathan, you had a, a, a question or share. Still here, Nathan? Uh, can you ask it for me? Okay. Um, I got to find to know. Okay. Interested to know what John thinks about the type of uh, formulation of troops, troops around the border in an unorderly fashion as a mechanized unit. Putin uh, pulled tactical groups all over the place instead of grade level units. They were under an unorganized command structure, caused communications breakdown, among other things. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of anomalies with this operation. Um, in general, I mean, it's, it's probably pretty safe to conclude that uh, Russian operations are going to be crappy, right? They're just not, they're not what the image and, and, and the reputation has been built up to be. And, um, but they power through it. And there's a certain learning process that they do, and they're willing to take you know, lots of casualties to figure it out. And um, I mean, they're set up to kind of hide those casualties too. I mean, they have portable uh, cremation following their, their, their units in order to you know, burn the body so they're not being brought back in body bags, uh, which caused disruption at home. So um, yeah, there's, you know, how they use it. They, I, I do think though that they thought it was gonna be done very, very quickly. And uh, to a certain extent, I think Putin was sold on that concept. And he's uh, taking action against some of the, the generals in, involved in doing that initial planning. And um, yeah, there's, there's still a lot of anomalies. I, and we're gonna hear more and more about why it worked the way it did. Um, but I do think it was under the initial expectation that it would be very, very quickly done very quickly and that a, you know, a, a rapid maneuver based operation minim that minimized casualties uh, and uh, infrastructure disruption was beneficial to Russia's overall goals in this. They would achieve their political objectives, um, demonstrate to the world that they were able to pull it off uh, through, you know, through operational excellence and that um, that didn't prove out. And now they're going back to the traditional kind of Russian approach where they're just beating things to death, uh, firepower heavy. Um, they've kept most of their good aircraft back out of the fray. Uh, don't want them picked off uh, and um, you know, with stingers and the like. And, um, a lot of the forces are still in place to be able to use them in case uh, there is a NATO intervention, which allow them to escalate both conventionally and through other means. That answer anything? You know, there, I, 
I'm not quite sure why they did a lot of what they did. I think they, I think uh, uh, it really is tied into this idea that they were doing, they thought that it was going to be easy, easier than it planned, turned out to be. Um, so we'll sneak in maybe a follow up. Okay. Uh, Julian, you had a, a question. Julian, are you here? Sure. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for chatting Hi. with us, John. Um, just based on the sort of trajectory that you're painting as the um, economic impacts of this open source network kind of continue to escalate, um, not that there isn't a fair degree of extremism already kind of present in Russia, or at least that's the picture that's being portrayed. Um, that kind of tactic seemed to directly drive Germany into the hands of Nazism uh, post World War One, as it just you know their economy collapsed and they just you know just propagated this distress um, that led to radicalization of the population. Is that not uh, a potential consequence of this? Is just further radicalization of Russia? And the oh oh yeah um, the you know we've been wrong uh, the West has always hated us this proves it um, that narrative is going to be built into something huge and um, you know the the degree of disconnection that we have uh, it, it could end up working in Putin's favor if if they're not able to see what we're saying um, and that. Uh, there has to be a certain amount of anger is, you know, they want, you know, they are saying we want to connect, but they won't connect with us. Uh, and that that's the reason why you, you when you go to the store, the, the shelves are empty, there's not all the processed foods and then in the product selection. And um, uh, that's why, uh, you know, you're not able to, you know, get the job that you want or do the things that you used to do. Um, because it becomes very personal at that point, right? Is that the job you had with, uh, XYZ company is not available to you anymore because a lot of these uh, actions being done by this network are being done on a personal level. Uh, it's not even done at you know at the just at the oligarchs. It's starting to percolate, you know, percolate uh, and uh, spread. Um, and there are like organizations taking action against individuals who happen to be Russian. So uh, it's not going to be good. Um, And, uh, you know, this war is going to, you know, if, if he wants to hold on to a portion of Ukraine, and it's going to be a long drawn out uh, guerrilla war. Uh, the amount of support pouring in, uh, and assuming that we don't get to a nuclear conflict, this is not going to go away. And uh, that can chew up a country like they saw in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and this is at a scale much larger. Um, so you know that could cause disruptions inside of Russia that could could spiral out of control. So that would be working against whatever narrative he has. But yeah, a lot of the extremism, you know, a lot of uh, you know the Duganism to a certain extent, you know, the the whole you know uh, structure of this this conversation could change over time. Any follow up, share, uh, Julian? Um, just, uh, I guess maybe a little, uh, request a little elaboration, um, because, you know, ultimately the economic collapse in Germany turned them into this engine that propelled them forward. Um, is, uh, is there like a similar way that this could actually empower Russia in an economic and military sense long-term? Um, that would be all. Thanks for letting me share Peter and John. I'm not so sure it, um, I mean, economies back then um, were a lot more self-contained. A lot more of the economic activity was limited to within that country. And now uh, so many of the products and services and things that we do in order to do the things we do are externally derived. And um, to try to recreate that within a single country would be very, very hard. Uh, China is able to do it to a large extent. Um, Russia can't do it, it just doesn't have the size. Uh, could it leverage China? 
perhaps, um, but I don't think the Chinese want to open up to Russia to do that, to include them in their network. So, um, you know, in terms of narrative, it will work great. Uh, and and um, they are, to a certain extent, are already kind of semi-fascist in their organization. Um, you know, corporate authoritarianism is essentially, a, you know, the, the initial part of fascism. And they do think in terms of their body and going after pieces that were lost. Um, that biological metaphor works as part of fascism. Um, but they aren't as, you know, aggressive internally. Uh, but economically, I don't see them doing it all through pirating and, and through, you know, stealing these goods and services and, and standing up. Um, I don't see enough dynamism. I don't see enough people. I don't see enough internal dynamics in order to pull off what China did. And China did it in large part because he, they were connected. <laughs> and this won't, you know, if they stay disconnected, it's not gonna be possible. So um, yeah, their only route to get forward is, is to, to roll the nuclear dice and try to break things open and break countries off. Um, and break their way back in. And that's the scary part. That makes sense? Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, you know, maybe I'll sneak in one last question. Um, I'm curious about uh, uh, the motivational, kind of like the deep motivational schema of people who are part of this open source movement. Um, and uh, like for some reason, you know, I don't know if you know John Michael Greer. Uh, he's a he's a druid, and he had some good analysis on like the <laughs> yeah. magic and like the Trump insurgency. Yeah. Uh, and I read his recent book, and he said that um, kind of he talked about how the Victorian age, how sex was repressed, and everything projected like everyone else was a sexual fiend, and then that kind of energy just blew up into the sexual revolution. Um, and then he and he made the a parallel that hate is our current version of sex. How this this emotion of hate is repressed. Is being projected on everyone else and this is going to blow up um and uh there seems to be a through line with a lot of uh these uh, network tribes or mimetic tribes that's like just this deep hate that's being projected um and i'm wondering if there's like a greater intimacy with that sort of like that emotional schema will allow sort of like getting into the ooda loop of you know this this kind of thing this entity that's emerging in order to like uh, um, invite a new uh, plausible promise. Um, yeah, how do you break, how do you break these online tribes? My theory with online tribalism is that it, um, it, it, it's never, you know, that tribal narrative is never built around positive stuff. It's only built around something you mutually oppose. And, um, you know, we have, you know, with a breakdown of, religion and uh, uh, kind of standards for you know, how to look at the world. We have uh, everyone deriving their own, uh, everyone, uh, we have everyone uh, uh, deriving their own version of what's good. So you have these online tribes that are building patterns of behavior that they oppose and that they can't agree on. And we see it like a, you know, uh, anti-fascist, anti-racist, anti anti-whatever, you know, um, all of that pattern making is done communally, and then it's 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 all negative. And those people who fit that pattern are hated. Um, you've asked those same groups what they're for; they couldn't tell you. They couldn't describe that kind of mutual thing. Each one would have a different way of doing it. So, is there a way to smash through that? I don't know. I mean, I do know that the open source framework will allow people to focus on something they're for, and that you're very innovative in getting that done. And we see, though, as in this circumstance, the thing that they're for is actually waging war, right? Uh, disconnecting, you know, taking the fight to Russia and disconnecting them. So uh, I guess be careful what you wish for again, right? So you get that, you get the positive thing, but it's the positive thing is. Uh, putting us all at risk. So um, I don't know how to, I mean, in theory, my, my approach to maybe uh, building a corrective to cohesion is that we need to focus on the attractors 
and make it attractive to join, make it attractive to work together. And then that one of the things that I was hoping for to see eventually with like crypto is a way that you can actually connect people financially and in other ways to a system. So they feel the benefit of everything that they do to the system. Now, right now you're part of like a, is the American or Canadian or whoever economy, or European economy, um, and you're not really connected to it. Uh, you, have, you, have, you can get some benefit out of it through your individual action, but the, the benefit being generated for the whole is not really accruing to you in any real measurable fashion. Um, in fact, it could be going act, actually the opposite, depending on where you live. So um, finding ways to make us all interested in actually moving the thing forward. And I think equity participation helps that. I came up with some ideas to do that maybe with like space development and maybe ocean development is that if you had, <clears throat> if we all were equity owners of the oceans or of space and anyone done it, did any mining there, and we were paid a royalty for it, I'd say, go, 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 right? Um, and the calculations from that is that everyone would be making a really excellent income very, very quickly from that kind of thing. Um, and then we would be interested in governing it correctly, at least putting the constraints on it that would maximize that income um, over the long term. So, um, you know, creating attractors. But everything that I've seen at the government level and at the network level tends to focus on um, stamping out the outliers or stamping out deviation and um, enforcing it and coercing alignment and coercing people into alignment, which is, you know, the end game of fascism is that you, you create a propaganda view of the world and uh, internal tribal narrative, and then you force the companies and the individuals all to focus on the, you know, you know, face in the same direction. And that allows you to have an authority, you know, a dictatorial capitalist economy that actually works. Um, but, you know, it can go, it, it, that, that method, as we've seen, brings you right off the edge of the world very, very quickly. You, you, you know, you're focused in, so focused on one direction, you'll eventually um, cause a disaster, mm -hmm. like a car with a locked steering wheel. <laughs> right. You can go really quick it's, until you hit a tree, right? So is that intelligible for you or it works? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that is like having an attractor, um, positive attractor is, is good. But I wonder if there's a, another move, like been reading all these esoteric stuff on egregores and they said how to like which is sort of like like as an occult version of what what you're talking about right um and they say one one way to pop someone out of an egregore is to create therapeutic blasphemy almost like do something that gives them an out so it has a therapeutic release but then they get to be uh, uh engaged in blasphemy against their their current sort of um egregore or, or network tribe so i'm wondering if there's two moves like have a positive attractor but engage in something akin to therapeutic blasphemy well, we, we see that with the descent function right now. Okay, so the descent function in society that is always like attacking everything. <laughs> I mean, there's a, you know, anyone who proposes any kind of standards, there's always somebody out there saying that sucks. Or, you know, there's a movement started to try to you know, overturn it. So there, that therapeutic blasphemy exists constantly. Um, but if you censor it out, make it go away, you ban those accounts, then um, you don't get that descent function anymore. There's no one to actually level set you, you know, to bring you back into alignment with reality. And then you're that car locked in, you know, the locked in steering wheel craning down the road at 150 miles an hour, that ability to turn. Mm -hmm. Reality goes that way. And you just keep on going that way. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, ultimately everything fails, any kind of, organization or organism, whatever, is when it is built and is proceeding uh, based on a view of reality that doesn't match re the, the real world. And if it gets too far, it, too far apart, that's death. That's the end of, end of that organism, end of that organization. 
you have to adapt. You have to constantly bring yourself back into alignment with the real, with the thing that will get you killed. It's not, not to say that, you know, I like the Nietzsche thing is that a lie can actually save you. And it's true, a lie can, can be beneficial to the world. Um, but uh, in general, you have to be uh, adapting to reality. And um, so John, we'll, we'll close here uh, for the people who are discovering from the store, discovering uh, your community, your work. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit more about uh, how uh, you guys cohere um, via Discord and stuff like that. Yeah, um, so I have a, a Patreon. Mike Destoa, and then it's been around for for a while now, and I had a you know a weblog before that, um, and it's a it does a report at the end of every month, uh, usually you know five six pages. I try to take like a book and, and squeeze it down to five pages and, and organize it in a very readable fashion. Um, so you get a lot of information, but it's you brought into the idea from something very simple all the way through to the complex idea. And you can you can kind of follow it, and it helps you structure the way reality is, and that the the community um, it gets together in two different ways. Is one is we have a I have a workspace uh, every month, and uh, it's basically you know a Google Doc that people can view, and then they can add not not completely edit, but you know add comments and add stuff to it. Um, there's lots of great discussions as people dive down. And as I come up with things that I'm observing, I'll put it in. Um, other people will do the same occasionally. Um, and then we also have a, a Discord. And um, yeah, we talk about all sorts of issues. So people put all sorts of content in there. And sometimes there's really great discussions on, on, on just about anything um, that, that's of interest. And a lot of it has to do with warfare and a lot of the concepts that we're dealing with in terms of networks. Um, And you know, general rule in the community, and this is probably what defines it, is that you know, you should be courteous. You know, you can't get anything done if you're not courteous to the other people, and you're not going to trying to sell your ideas or convince anyone else that you're you're correct. And that um, you know, you want to should be there only if you want to learn and try to figure out what's going on. So for the most part, we're focused on you know building frameworks or creating frameworks of, of understanding of what's going on in the world now. And sometimes that can be focused on what you do now as personally, or focused on, you know, the way the world is going and understanding all of that onslaught of news that you, you're getting hit with every day, you know, and uh, doing it outside of the tribal frameworks, the tribal, you know, enforced tribal ways of looking at the world. Um, Yeah. So that's I, it. That's that's the basic thing. Um, yeah, it, uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, so here's the, the link, and I highly recommend it. Um, I'm a member, and I think I'm going to start being active on the Discord. And it's a wonderful way to get some sense making and then you know to inform your choice making and uh, uh, the attractor of uh, John's innate stoicism uh, <laughs> usually attracts uh, a lot of good people to that community. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, sign up for that. These sessions will be available for both Stoa people and uh, the people from John's uh, Patreon. But uh, um, if you're interested in deep dive in John's community, sign up for his uh, Patreon. Um, so do you think this is cool to post on uh, uh, YouTube, John, uh, this one? Uh, I, I think it's fine. Um, it just up to the members if anyone really has any big problem with, uh, uh, you know, being featured on it, uh, you know, let you know um or let me know that they don't want to be featured on it um yeah and i think i think people who are actually didn't want to be recorded probably didn't say anything anyway they were just right. we're on the on the pages of of people who are up on the um listening in but didn't say anything so i think it's okay very cool and if you're from uh, uh john's community you can go to the store we have a lot of uh um cool philosophical type events. One of them coming up on Sunday is practicing the stoic contemplation of the sage exercise. Uh, so something we might need uh, during this time and that's uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Ours should be on the stoic.ca. Uh, so that being said, John, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the stoic today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody.